A reading from the book of Genesis. The man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have produced a man with the help of the Lord. Next she bore his brother Abel. Abel became a keeper of flocks, and Cain a tiller of the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought an offering to the Lord from the fruit of the soil, while Abel, for his part, brought one of the best firstlings of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not. Cain greatly resented this and was crestfallen, so the Lord said to Cain, Why are you so resentful and crestfallen? If you do well, you can hold up your head, but if not, sin is a demon lurking at the door. His urge is toward you, yet you can be his master. Cain said to his brother Abel, Let us go out into the field. When they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord asked Cain, Where is your brother Abel? He answered, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord then said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the soil. Therefore, you shall be banned from the soil that opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. If you till the soil, it shall no longer give you its produce. You shall become a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is too great to bear. Since you have now banished me from the soil, and I must avoid your presence and become a restless wanderer on the earth, anyone may kill me at sight. Not so, the Lord said to him. If anyone kills Cain, Cain shall be avenged sevenfold. So the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest anyone should kill him at sight. Adam again had relations with his wife, and she gave birth to a son whom she called Seth. God has granted me more offspring in place of Abel, she said, because Cain slew him. Verbum Domini. Offer to God a sacrifice of praise. God the Lord has spoken and summoned the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you, for your burnt offerings are before me always. Offer to God a sacrifice of praise. Why do you recite my statutes and profess my covenant with your mouth, that though you hate discipline and cast my words behind you, Offer to God a sacrifice of praise. You sit speaking against your brother. Against your mother's son you spread rumors. When you do these things, shall I be deaf to it? Or do you think that I am like yourself? I will correct you by drawing them up before your eyes. Offer to God a sacrifice of praise. I am the way, the truth. 
Dominus Fabiscum. Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Marcum. The Pharisees came forward and began to argue with Jesus, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. He sighed from the depth, depth of his spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Amen, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. Then he left them, got into the boat again, and went off to the other shore. Verbum Domini. Today, in the first reading from the book of Genesis, we have the account of Cain and Abel. And I think the obvious theme here is uh, the theme of brotherhood, that we are all called to brotherhood, to brotherhood, to be brothers and sisters uh, with one another. And this is rooted in the fact that we are made in God's image. We are all children of God and therefore uh, brothers and sisters of one another. And today in the account, we have a, a beautiful, simple line here that cuts to the heart of this, I think. We're told that the man had relations with his wife, Eve, she conceived, and then she says, I have produced a man with the help of the Lord. That Adam and Eve had the conjugal relations, but that in itself wasn't sufficient to procreate, right, to have a son. She says, I have produced a man with the help of the Lord, that Eve had this great sense of the work of God in her. And that's an important element of our faith is that God creates the human soul, infuses it in the person. It's not a product of the, the father and the mother, the human father and the mother, but God acts directly in the woman, a great privilege for the woman. We don't say that about the man, but God acts directly in the woman. We see her great dignity and sanctity there. And that for us, it means that we come from God. God willed us personally into existence by a, an immediate act of creation, the phrase the church uses. He creates the human soul. So we very much come from God, and we are destined for God. And that's our great <coughs> dignity, made in his image and likeness, destined to share an eternal life with him uh, forever. Now, <clears throat> we see the struggle, though, to maintain this dignity to maintain and foster this brotherhood among us. Abel, we're told, he is the keeper of flocks, Cain, the tiller of the soil. And the fact that they have these different jobs, roles, vocations, we could say, I think is an image of the fraternity of all mankind. We see, as Pope Francis described it, an evolution of society here, this, this growth of humanity. And it's a, you know, their brotherhood is an image of the universal call to brotherhood of the human, human family. We had Adam and Eve, the first couple. We have there the, the institution of marriage shown to us. And here that's growing and we're seeing uh, the fraternity, the communion, that society, that human beings are to have as a society, as a culture together. So they have differing occupations, but still called to interdependence. To, to help one another. And then we see they feel this call to make an offering to the Lord. And this is in us naturally, right? But reason can tell us that God exists and that we should come to know him, to love him, to serve him, to be, to be worshiped. There's a, and we can see this cross-culturally, even without Judeo-Christian revelation, this this uh, belief in a, some kind of God, you know, some kind of power greater than ourselves. Christian revelation tells us that he is a father, that he's personal and as a trinity for us as Christians. But there's something in us that we know, reason tells us God exists, that we're called to, to believe in him and to worship him. So Abel does the right thing. He offers 
the best uh, firstlings of his flock. And we're not told exactly what Cain did not do, but I guess we could presume that he did not offer the first fruits of the harvest, and God did not look with favor upon his offering. So first, we see there's a problem, a distortion in their relationship with God. You know, Abel did the right thing, Cain did the wrong thing. So there's this break in a relationship with God. And then there's a break in their relationship with one another. We saw the same thing with Adam and Eve after the fall, right? They, they are naked and now they have shame and they have lost control of uh, their inner person, their passions and things. And, and there's a break in the harmony that the original couple was intended to have. So we see a similar break here in Abel and Cain, and that uh, Cain becomes resentful, crestfallen, when he looks at the, how God is pleased with Abel's offering. And God's counsel to Cain is to do well and hold your head up. You know, do the right thing, you can hold your head up. And that is so powerful for us today, isn't it? We, we get caught up in comparing ourselves to others, looking at others, and the solution for us is to focus on our own relationship with God first. Not to be, right, uh, you know, uh, Peter's told the same thing about John, don't worry, you know, at the resurrection appearance on the beach, he tells him, don't worry about, you know, John's destiny, you know, you follow me, you know, take up your cross and follow me. And that's a, the same solution for us in our life. I think, to keep our eyes on the cross, to be busy with our vocation, our spiritual life first, to grow in holiness, and we don't get caught up in what others are doing. But also, I think in this little exchange, you know, it's like God comes to Cain and tries to encourage him. You know, do the right thing. Keep your head up. You know, if you don't, if you sin, you know, sin is a demon lurking at the door. His urge is toward you, yet you can be his master. If you put your efforts into doing the right thing, and we know as part of our revelation to depend on God to ask for his grace, we don't have to give in to sin. We can be transformed by Christ. But I, I think we see the tenderness of God, that he's not waiting to punish us. He's not desirous to punish us. He's trying to, to encourage Cain here. And it's a beautiful expression of his fatherhood towards us, that he's guiding us, that he loves us that he's present to us. He's present to us. He sees everything about our life and he wants us to do the right thing. But we have this stern warning that sin is a demon. His urge is toward you. He has this urge, this desire, uh, the evil angels and to control us. And he does that when we commit sin, right? He has a certain ownership over us, a certain possessiveness over us when we commit sin. And the other lesson here too is, you know, he became resentful. And that resentment, again, this turning inward or focusing on the other person can separate us from God and we can, uh, you know, be led to commit further sin. And that's what he does, right? He tells Abel, let us go to the field. Let's take a walk. Let's check out my crops, you know. <laughs> and he plans this horrible deed to kill Abel and, and, and follows through on it. And then we see God comes again, you know, where is your brother? It's a, I think it's an echo of, you know, God looking for Adam and Eve in the garden. You know, Adam, where are you? He calls out to him. And we have that extreme pathos of, of a father calling for his children who are lost and broken. Where is your brother? And then Cain, replies, I, am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's keeper? We've all, I think, been there and, and want to separate ourselves from others, not really to care about others. We're all tempted to that in some way, to live our own lives of selfishness, and that's replayed in humanity again and again. But God is telling us, he's telling Cain, we are called to live as one. And as I said, we see this evolution of society in this Genesis account that we're called in charity not just to live as neighbors, not just to live kind of in a civic situation of peacefulness maybe and hopefully justice, 
but to actually be brothers, to have charity, to have love for one another. Reason can show us that we are equals, but it is when we recognize God as Father that makes us truly brothers, that we have a, a common Father, that this communion, this family we have is rooted in a tr the transcendent fatherhood of God. That impels us to be our brother's keeper, to care about what happens to him, how things are going for him, and to share what we have with him. So sin and selfishness tears at this family of God. But the good news is that in Christ, we see the formation of the family of God. He has come to, to reform, to heal what was so broken, to be, and we're called to be part of his body, that we're called not just to have a, a personal relationship with God, to, but, but to be united with one another in charity, to love God and neighbor, and that we are called to share in the very relationship that Jesus has with his Father. He's revealing the Father, this relationship, this call that we have to us. Yes, you have a, you're called to an unbelievable relationship with God, to be, call him Father, and to call everyone else brothers and sisters. And this is accomplished, as we're told in Romans 5, 5, through the Holy Spirit that's poured into our hearts, that unites us with Christ and one another. As we're drawn into Christ, we're drawn in communion with, with each other. It unites us with Christ and one another. That's a great role of the Holy Spirit, united in his mystical body. So we are objects of God's love and subjects of his love. We experience his charity, his love, and we are called to, to give that to others, to be instruments of grace, to pour that love upon others. Pope Francis recently, actually it was last year, he, he spoke about that fraternity is first learned in the family, in the natural family. And this is seen especially in the complementarity of the roles of each of its members, it's particularly the father and the mother. We see this interdependence. We first learn this called a charity in the family. I recently heard, just as an aside, the role of the father in particular. When the father is not present, there's all kinds of statistics to show that there's disciplinary problems, even uh, you know, greater struggles with being incarcerated and joining gangs and things like that that ravages so many uh, communities in our country. And interesting, there was a study too that, that showed that the role, the father has a particular role in impacting whether the children believe in God or belong to church. That if they see that respect that the father has for God, for the church, they're much more likely to develop that relationship themselves. And I, that's very interesting because we often think of the mother as handing on the faith, handing on the gift of faith through her spiritual life and her a special gift of a, a spiritual sense that she has. But the father, the human father is a special image of God the Father and instills that respect and that attitude, that call we are to have towards a loving Father. May we be faithful, may we be our brother's keepers, may we foster this family of God that we're all called to.